You're listening to Answering the Call, the official podcast of the 12th Man Foundation. Our show provides listeners with an insider perspective of Texas A&M Athletics and its greatest supporters. This podcast will bring you exclusive interviews with coaches, athletes, donors, and the dedicated staff of Aggie Athletics and the 12th Man Foundation. You ready? Let's dive into today's episode. Welcome to the very first episode of Answering the Call. My name is Ivy Robinson, and I am your host for this podcast. For those of you who do not know me, I am the Director of Communications and Creative Services here at the 12th Man Foundation, and I recently became editor of the 12th Man Magazine, but I am just so thrilled to be hosting Answering the Call on behalf of the 12th Man Foundation, and Man, even more excited to be in studio today with our very first guest, 12th Man Foundation President and CEO, Travis Dabney. Travis, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Ivy. Um, Couldn't you have found a better first guest for this podcast than me? (laughs) Oh, not at all. Not at all. You are definitely the best first guest for this podcast. It's the first time in 12th Man Foundation history that we're launching a podcast. And so what better person to have than our leader of the organization? So now... Travis, I do want to mention something before we get into the heart of the episode. I have to bring this up in light of recent events. How did it feel catching that foul ball at Blue Bell Park in Game 2 of the Super Regional uh, with Aggie Baseball? Yeah, it, it was pretty surreal, to be honest with you. You know, we were hosting a number of donors in Frosty Gillum Suite for that Oregon Super Regional. I was just up there visiting, and uh, the ball was coming at me. I didn't have a lot of time to react. I just put my left hand up, and it ball went right into it, and it stuck. So, uh, yeah, it was it was pretty neat. I I do think that immediately after they showed me on television, I had something like two hundred text messages within within like thirty minutes. But, but it, was, it was a lot of fun. I got a lot of people giving me grief about having a beer in one hand and catching the ball in the other, which is true. I was drinking Modelo, and no, Modelo has not offered me any type of NIL <laughs> Come deal, on, Modelo. Which, is, which is frankly disappointing to me. But, hey, you know, we're going we're gonna to move forward. I'm going to stick with my day job and, and keep going from here. But, yeah, it was, it was fun, the reaction of a lot of friends that I've made over the years. <laughs> it's, it's something that... That, uh, people are still giving me a little grief about. Yeah, truly an iconic moment. I feel like that'll go down in Tolman Foundation history for sure. So Travis, I also want to mention for our listeners, I thought it would be beneficial to lay some groundwork and just explain to our listeners why we decided to launch a podcast. Yeah. Can you speak to that and kind of the heart behind why we decided to do this? Yeah. Um, so I, I, I am a strong believer that you have to move with the times and, and clearly podcast or something um, uh, are, are a way to reach audiences um, that is relatively new, not, not brand new, but relatively new. And I thought it would be a great opportunity for us to potentially speak to a portion of our A&M community and potentially others that this is how they absorb information. Um, so, you know, we're going to give this a shot. I think you're going to do a great job, Ivy, hosting this. And, and I think it's an opportunity for the 12th Man Foundation to tell its story. And that part is really important to me. I, I am, after almost 25 years of employment at the 12th Man Foundation, I don't think it would be a shock to anyone that this place is very special to me. Obviously, Texas A&M and the 12th Man Foundation. And I really want the A&M community to know what we're about at the 12th Man Foundation, what we seek to accomplish, and what, frankly, we're not involved in. Because so often when you read on the internet, whether it's in social media or fan sites or some other place like that, there is misperception, misunderstanding about what this organization does. And I think this is going to be an opportunity to set the record straight. But I think it's also going to be, and more importantly, an opportunity to say what we do work towards, who we impact, and actually how we do it. And so I I really look forward to you taking up the mantle, um, leading that effort, 
you're not going to hear me very frequently on this podcast because there are a lot of people uh, that are going to be able to tell the story of the 12th Man Foundation from their own unique individual perspective that's going to be way more impactful. You know, I really look forward to listening. And the last thing I'll just say about podcast. So, you know, my wife and I, we, we will try and go on a walk in the evening after the kids go to bed or, um, you know, if, if we have, uh, have the opportunity to spend some time together that way. But if she can't go on a walk when I do in the evening, I'll listen to a podcast and, you know, I'm not going to get into which ones I listen to. I don't want to isolate anybody on that, but it is just an awesome way to absorb information. And so I, I think, I think this is, this is a really unique opportunity for the 12th Man Foundation. I agree. I completely agree. I think it's going to be great for our listeners and on behalf of the 12th Man Foundation. I mean, the best advocate is the organization itself. And so people will be able to, like you said, absorb information straight from the source, straight from the 12th Man Foundation. Yes. And, and really learn about our mission and what we are impacting here at Texas A&M. And so I completely agree. You said something in that response, though, Travis, that, you know, Texas A&M is extremely important to you. You came to Texas A&M. Can you just start off by telling us where you are from and why you chose to attend Texas A&M? So some people have heard this from me before, but you know, I'm a third generation Aggie. My grandfather went to school here at Texas A&M, graduated in 1923. He was here when E. King Gill was playing basketball at Texas A&M and, and knew E. King Gill. And my father went to school here. My uncle went to school here. I have a couple of sisters that went to school here. And so this institution is in my family's blood. I can remember oftentimes coming up here and going to football games, sitting in the old horseshoe in the north end zone with my dad. I can remember being on my dad's shoulders at bonfires. Um, and so I never wanted to go anywhere but Texas A&M. Um, and uh, that hasn't changed after all of this time. I still love this place. I know that this place is capable of so much, and we have seen points in time where we have done some incredible things, and I think the best days are ahead of Texas A&M, and I really look forward to being a part of that in our own small way at the 12th Man Foundation and how we impact Texas A&M athletics. And, and again, you know, a six-year-old boy in Houston, Texas, got in a car with his dad and his brother and came up here for a football game. Uh, unfortunately, A&M lost that football game and I cried the whole way home, but I've been hooked ever since and I don't ever see that changing. Man, that's that's so great. Thank you for speaking to that. I love that it's in your blood, literally. Like that's that's just so neat. What a awesome connection to this university. What did you study at Texas A and M? And you also wrote for the Bat, correct? Can you talk about those two things? <laughs> yeah. So I studying in Texas A and M. You know, probably probably should have studied more while I was at Texas A and M for sure. But I was a history major here at A and M. I had a number of different thoughts about what I would do post college. Being a fundraiser was not one of them. Um, but you know, quick quick story there. I actually was working at Dell in um, uh, sales, and I wrote a letter. This is how long ago it was to an individual that I knew at the Twelfth Man Foundation, saying I was interested if there was anything that had ever, you know, come up from for employment here. And I just knew that when I wrote that letter, I loved A and M. I loved Texas A and M athletics. I wanted to be impactful to a place that I cared so much about. And I knew that if I ever had that opportunity, it wouldn't be like work. It would be, you know, pursuing a passion. And so luckily that individual called me back. I came over, I interviewed, they offered me the job the next day and that's going on 25 years ago. So the, the way things work in life, the timing of things is amazing. And I know that you know that, Ivy, I know it, people that are listening. The timing is everything. And timing worked just right for me. 
in that particular circumstance. And I'm just so thankful for it and for the opportunity that I've been given. Going off of that, what was that first position at the Tolpan Foundation? And tell us about what that was like and then the, the advancement through the organization. Yeah. So I started and I was the call center manager and development officer for annual fund. And really my responsibility was as the call center manager. And so we had calling shifts of students. We probably had something in the neighborhood of 80 student employees working at the 12th Man Foundation at that time. And their responsibility was to call donors and prospective donors, get their season tickets renewed, get them to join the 12th Man Foundation, present all of the positives of this organization. And so we had an afternoon calling shift around lunchtime, and then we had an evening calling shift that went from 6 to 9. And so I would come in work at about uh, 10 o'clock. We would start that afternoon calling shift, and then we'd work right on through until 9 o'clock. We had some great results in that time period, um, and uh, just just a really enjoyable experience to work with all of those students and you know built built a lot of great relationships during that time period and and got some visibility into development work and kind of set me off for what my next my next phase would be at the 12th man foundation would you say there were any key individuals at the organization when you took that first position that really were pivotal in your career path? Yeah, I, I think there's there's a couple of people that I would reference there. Um, Reagan Cheshire, who works at the Texas A&M Foundation now as a development officer, was very supportive in, in my early time at the 12th Man Foundation. Miles Marks, who was the president and CEO of the organization, was very supportive. A number of board members at the time, you know, Fred Heldenfels, Carrie Baker, you know, just a number of people that were, were very supportive of me and, and my maturing process as it related to the 12th Man Foundation. But in the end, you know, what I would point to is this. Working with Aggies, what, what more could one ask for? I mean, you know, I could be a pretty average fundraiser, and at Texas A&M, the way people feel about Texas A&M, just got to present the, the cause, just got to present the reason why Aggies are going to get on board. And so just incredibly thankful for that. How would you describe the culture, of the 12th Man Foundation, from the time you started and, and what it is today? What's remained, you think? Yeah, I, I think the... So culture of an organization, and you would know this, Ivy, because you've heard me talk about this, but you you can't overcome bad culture in an organization. And look, talk is cheap. You know, anybody can say those words, but are they actually living them? And so if I go back to my early days and all the way till today in terms of what remains, what I would tell you is, is that the staff at the 12th Man Foundation – we want Texas A&M athletics to be successful. We want Texas A&M to be successful. And we're committed to that every single day. And that culture has always existed at the 12th Man Foundation. And I, and I believe wholeheartedly that off into the future it's going to remain because we, we have former students and we have some non-former students, but we have former students that work at the 12th Man Foundation who feel it as I point at my heart, they feel it right here. And there's a difference between going to some office and selling a widget or something like that, that, hey, you know, it's just, it is what it is. It's a job. It's a way to make a living versus coming to work at the 12th Man Foundation every day and feeling it deep in your heart that you want to do right by Texas A&M University and Texas A&M Athletics the number of times that I have actually gotten up in the morning in my 25 years and gone to work and actually didn't want to go to work, I probably can count it on one hand. Because again, this is something that we all feel really connected to and want to be supportive of. Absolutely. That camaraderie is a bond that really just fuels our passion, right? And it it fuels our desire to do better and to pursue excellence and yeah, definitely and, agree. And and Ivy, you know, the, the things that transpire that reinforce that are things like 
going to Omaha and playing for the national championship this year. It is things like Johnny Manziel's 2012 season and being in the stands in the Cotton Bowl when we beat Oklahoma. It is, you know, being a part of just great wins, proud moments, and you just fuels you to want to recreate that on a consistent basis for Texas A&M. I know our former students and supporters of the 12th Man Foundation want that. I know our staff wants that. I know everyone within Texas A&M Athletics wants that. And so that's, you know, that's what fuels us and drives us to continue to do this and do it at a really, really high level. So, Travis, this September will begin your eighth year as president and CEO of the 12th Man Foundation. Can you walk us through the emotions you felt when you became the leader of this organization in 2017? Um, fear. Yeah. You know, so I'm not one that hides my concerns about anything. I'm pretty much an open book and I, I I would never walk into a room and say, I got this. This is no problem. You know, forget about it. That's, that's really the antithesis of who I am. I, I worried about my ability to lead a staff of, you know, 40 plus employees. I worried about uh, any number of different things and I still worry about it. Um, and I think that's an indication by the, by the way, not of anything other than really caring. And so have I gained confidence in my role as the president and CEO of the 12th Man Foundation and feel more secure today than I did eight years ago? Yeah, I think that's the case. But I still worry every single day. Is our culture good? Are we providing the resources that we need to? Are we outreaching to our donors and prospective donors with the frequency that we need to? Are we providing the service that we need to? Are we delivering tickets on time? All of these things I am genuinely concerned about. Now, we plan for those things. We execute on those plans. It doesn't mean that we are without mistake. We make mistakes. But I think what we do when we make those mistakes is really important. You acknowledge them. You learn from them. You make every effort to avoid those in the future. And so, again, you know, some some leaders, leadership will you know, would answer this question from the perspective. I knew I had it. I always knew I had it. It was just a matter of time. Well, that's just not who I am. And you can find somebody that can fill the role that way. But that level of arrogance is not the way I operate. On that same note, reflecting on your time as leader, what has been the most challenging and also the most rewarding? There's been a lot of challenges since I became the president of the organization in 2017. <laughs> Um, there's been a number of things that happened, a number of head coach transitions, a number of athletic director transitions. We had this little thing called COVID, which was interesting. Then this other little thing called NIL, which has been interesting. And we are literally in the midst of this house case. And while, you know, it's not like anybody's calling the 12th Man Foundation saying, hey, What's your response to the house case? It's going to impact this organization. But when I go back to really challenging times, I would reference COVID. If, if, you know, for people that are listening to this podcast, some may remember, but likely many don't, that we had just completed renewals at the 12th Man Foundation when the world got shut down for all intents and purposes. And so March, I believe, 11th, we went into a remote work environment. We had completed renewals on, uh, I think, March 2nd of that year. And so the questions immediately began. Are you going to refund my, my ticket and, and contribution cost if we don't play football? You know, and, and that went on for a number of months and so when you talk about things that are, are you asked the question about what are you proud of, what I am proud of is, one, how we communicated, the staff and the board of trustees from the 12th Man Foundation with our season ticket holders, with our donors in that process in an incredibly challenging environment. 
Another thing that I am really proud of is, you know, we had 25% capacity that year. We had a number of donors that just gave their investment for that football season to the organization to assist Texas A&M Athletics, in which was a financial calamity that we lived, as did the entirety of the world and college football. And so the donations back to the 12th Man Foundation in that time period were um, instrumental for us to be able to move forward and not hamstring athletics into the future. Um, And then I'm just incredibly proud of the way the staff came together in that time period, recognized the very challenging environment and what needed to be communicated to donors, did it, did it gracefully, and we came through it better on the other side. And so in the darkest of moments is my biggest moment of pride for my fellow staffers at the 12th Man Foundation and the way they handled that incredibly challenging situation. And let me just say this really clearly. That wasn't Travis Dabney. That was the staff at the 12th Man Foundation. And I was just a part of it. And and that's that's that is true on all of the good things that the 12th Man Foundation does. It's never Travis Dabney. And this is not faux humility. I mean what I'm saying. The staff at the 12th Man Foundation is incredible, and they are the ones that make certain things possible along with our donors, and I'm just incredibly thankful for it. Man, yeah, that that time of COVID, it was such a challenge, and I love hearing stories of, obviously I was not at the 12th Man Foundation during that time, but just hearing how the staff truly came together and rallied around this huge challenge, this huge obstacle and walking into that, not knowing what the future was going to hold. And honestly, it's kind of the same situation today with NIL. Like we do not know what the future holds with college athletics and college sports. And, you know, you just each day you have to go into it with a a positive mindset and and take on those challenges head on. Absolutely. I mean, I think what we know now is the only constant is change. And so we're, we're, we're going to have to live that. And I, I would just, just point out, that at the end of that COVID season in 2020, we played North Carolina and Mac Brown in the Orange Bowl, and we beat them. And it was a culmination of a really long, drawn-out year, but it ended it ended beautifully with Devon A. Chain busting off about a 60-yard run in the Orange Bowl. And so, yeah, I've just... I look back on that whole experience and just pride for my fellow staffers and my fellow Aggies as to the way, the graceful way that we came through that. Absolutely. And we're so thankful, like you said, Travis, for the Tolman Foundation donors who stepped up and, and contributed during that time. For sure. Speaking of the challenges, staying on that note, I mean, you just said the norm is change right now in college athletics and it's ever evolving each day. So, how would you describe the current environment of college sports right now? And what is it like from your perspective working through these challenges? Yeah. You know, so I I can look at this Ivy from, from two different perspectives. Uh, You know, I'm still a fan at, at my heart. Um, You know, I love the athletic programs at Texas A&M and I look back with fondness at simpler times when money wasn't such a huge part of the conversation and when you know you could get recruiting news from the Bryan College Station Eagle and that's no shade on my buddy Billy Lucci and Texas they do a fantastic job but it was a simpler time and yeah today is not nearly as simple it, it is evolving and so I, I would just say this if I put my employee of the 12th Man Foundation hat on and the way I look at this, and you know this from my most recent letter in the 12th Man Foundation magazine, I'm a really, I mean, at the end of the day, I'm a capitalist, Ivy. I believe in capitalism and I believe that people are worth what someone is willing to pay them. And I think the rules that existed around compensation for student athletes And the Supreme Court has spoken pretty clearly on this, 
but I think the rules were antiquated at best. And I believe that we're going to come through this time period and whatever we look like 10, 15, 25 years from now, I think people are going to look back and recognize that the fact that the folks that were on the playing field were not getting compensated for their efforts. And I know people will point to, you know, tuition, books, room, board. Yes, understood. Those things are impactful. No question about it. They're important. But the millions of dollars that the football and basketball and other sports produce and the fact that the student athlete wasn't being paid for that, controversial, yes, I get it. But I'm I'm a strong believer that people should be paid for their work. And, and so I'm supportive of the student athletes as it relates to that. And I don't know what the world's going to look like. The world of college athletics is going to look like next week, much less 25 years from now. But we know this. It's going to look different. And at the 12th Man Foundation, we're going to adapt and we're going to support to the best of our ability championship athletics at Texas A&M. So supporting through this era, for some of our listeners, they – They might understand how the 12-man foundation fits into this whole picture, Mm -hmm. but some of our listeners may not understand how we are impacting and supporting Texas A&M athletics through these times. So can you speak to that a little bit and provide some clarity? Yeah. So as it relates, Ivy, specifically to NIL, there is a lot of confusion out there about the way support is happening. And and I would really reference uh, two entities. One is Texas Aggies United. It is the collective for, it's the official collective of Texas A&M Athletics. And Texas Aggies United can take direct support from supporters of Texas A&M Athletics and make sure that that support is then divvied out to the student athletes at Texas A&M in a number of different varieties, okay, in all sports. And I would encourage anybody that is interested in that conversation to contact Texas Aggies United. JT Higgins runs that program over there. JT is a longtime friend of mine, a former head golf coach here at Texas A&M, and just overall great guy and wants to see Texas A&M do great. There is another way to support NIL. It is not as direct, but at the 12th Man Foundation, a donor can make a gift to the unrestricted annual fund. Some of those dollars support marketing of our organization. And in the effort to market this organization, student athletes will be contacted via, you know, any number of different entities to say, hey, would you be interested in speaking on behalf of the 12th Man Foundation, making an appearance, making a speech, any number of different potentials there? And then they will be compensated for that. And so while we don't do deals directly with a student athlete, and we don't pick the student athlete that represents, there is a stable, obviously, of student athletes here that can speak on behalf of the 12th Man Foundation on our mission, on why it's positive. And so an individual can support us. Again, it's not nearly as direct as Texas Aggies United. And I would encourage anyone to make a contribution or an investment with Texas Aggies United. It's incredibly important for our ability to be successful today. But for other individuals, for any different or for a variety of reasons, they may prefer to come to the 12th Man Foundation, and we will welcome that investment at the 12th Man Foundation. While being transparent, can't specify the student athlete, cannot specify the sport. That's not the way this works here. But there will be recipients that are student athletes of the promotion of our organization. It's a little bit of a difficult concept, but you know we were we're going to continue to communicate to the best of our ability on that, and I do think over time we're going to have success there. And you know, Ivy, one thing that I, I think is is a challenge for us that we will continue to have to to live with is we live it. You and I and the staff at the Twelfth Man Foundation, we live it every single day. And so we have lingo and nomenclature that we use in the office that everybody just understands. But other people have lives outside of Texas A&M athletics and NIL. 
and transfer portal and the house case. And they're not living this and diving into it every single day. And so for us to figure out how we communicate clearly, concisely about how you can support, it's challenging, but it's what this podcast is really about. It is the opportunity. And so this is not the last conversation we're going to have about NIL on this podcast, it will probably be a part of everyone. And so, you know, if you're not interested in the NIL conversation, this may not be the podcast for you, but give us a chance anyway. So, cause there'll be other things in here that we'll, that we'll hear from. That's right. Yeah. Travis has given some episode teasers here. The, the conversation will definitely heavily revolve around NIL and in this modern era of college sports. And so we've got a lot of great content in store for sure with this podcast. And as we bring in leadership across the athletic department and we bring in student athletes and we bring in constituents across the university to talk about how Texas A&M is dealing with these, these challenges, it'll, it'll be great content. And so stick around. If you're listening to this very first episode, it's going to be a good, a great time and great conversations will be had. Travis, we're getting close to wrapping up. I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about the 12 Men Foundation and how it's celebrating its 75th anniversary. So for three quarters of a century, the 12 Men Foundation has supported Texas A&M Athletics and Aggie student athletes. Can you speak to the organization's history a little bit, you know, dating all the way back to the Aggie Club in 1950? And how does it feel to be a part of this organization and leading it during the, the anniversary year? Yeah, well, as 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 I've mentioned earlier, you know, it's a big honor to work here, and it's it's a it's a point of pride, and something that I feel very passionately about. The organization's history, I think, is one that's really unique. You know, when you look across the country and and you compare Texas A and M to other big state institutions, we're we're unique, right? I mean, everything about Texas A and M is unique. Uh, Our history and how this institution has developed and just exploded really in the last 50 years. It's just an amazing story about Texas A&M. But I I, I did get to know a gentleman uh, by the name of Harry Green that some of our listeners will know. Harry was the executive director of the Aggie Club and then ultimately the 12th Man Foundation for many years. Harry's memory is one that I envied um, because until the day he passed, just incredibly sharp. And he's told he told me many stories about the evolution of the organization. You know, we used to be officed over in the historic district out of a house many years ago. And then the home of the Aggie Club, which was a building on the north end of Kyle Field that many people will remember was given to the Aggie Club by the university president. And I think it was M.T. Harrington, but I could be wrong about that as as office space. And the organization really just started to grow thereafter. But I, I would just point this out, that the 12th Man Foundation and the Aggie Club before it agnostically supports Texas A&M athletics. We don't pick who receives scholarships. We don't pick who the athletic director is. We don't pick who the head coaches are. And when those head coaches come and go for whatever reason, we're not impactful or a part of that process either. What we are here to do is represent the donors to Texas A&M athletics, present a a case for giving, whether that is the purchase of a season ticket or a major gift to renovate a facility. Funding is is really truly our responsibility and what we stay focused on. And I, I like to say to our staff and to donors that if we stay focused on that mission and stay out of things that don't involve or are not the purview of this organization, success is going to come. And I believe that we're living that today, and I believe we're going to continue to live that. And we're going to do that by being professional in our organization. We're going to do that by being clear and honest with our donors 
and present the case for giving. And we're going to do that by working with the university president and the athletic director and all of our head coaches to represent their needs and what it, what it means to support Texas A&M athletics. So I'm proud of the history of the 12th Man Foundation. It's one that we all should be proud of. Our donors should be proud of it. And I think when you look at the financial support that comes through the 12th Man Foundation and you compare that across the country, while I'm not going to sit here and tell you today we're number one, you're in, you're out, we're right at the very top. And I'm proud of what has been done, and I attribute that all to the donors and what they make possible. Thank you for speaking to that, Travis. Absolutely. It's a, an incredible organization with such an incredible history, and to see it evolve over the years, too, is just phenomenal. So Absolutely. Here's to the next 75. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever they look like. <laughs> That's right. Here we come. So to wrap up, Travis, what are you most excited about for the upcoming athletic year? Well, I'm super excited about Mike Elko. Mike is just a fantastic human being. I've really enjoyed getting to know him and spending a little bit of time with him. And I, I do believe he has a really unique vision for Texas A&M football. So obviously I'm super excited about that. Super excited about seeing the Aggie band at halftime against Notre Dame, uh, no matter whatever the temperature may be at that game, and uh, college game day, and Connor Wegman, and, you know, Noah Thomas, and, and Nick Scorton. I'm just, I'm, I'm just so excited to see football back in a new era for Texas A&M. And then I think I would be remiss if I if I just left out, and I'm not going to, all the success that transpired in this previous academic year. Um, the women's tennis team winning the national championship, the success for women's golf, the success for baseball. It, it, was, it was just a really awesome year. And I think the coaches – that are at Texas A&M, and look, this is just from a fan's perspective, right? The coaches, I just think, are extraordinary here, whether it's Trisha Ford, Garrett Chadwell, you know, Mark Weaver, what an outstanding guy Mark Weaver is. It just, it, it really fills me with a lot of pride and a lot of optimism for the future that we have these really invested coaches at Texas A&M that believe in this institution, that believe in the mission and the core values of this institution. And man, they're producing on the field. And so I, I'm just super excited about that. And I mean, really, what's not to be excited about when you've got Notre Dame coming in on August 31st, a new head football coach, and just a, just a lot of optimism for the future. Travis Dabney on the very first episode of Answering the Call podcast. Travis, thank you so much again for joining us today. Thank you, Ivy. Really enjoyed it. Thank you for joining us on another episode of Answering the Call, the official podcast of the 12th Man Foundation. A special shout out to our incredible podcast producer, Megan Hoffman, and to 12th Man Productions for their generous use of this studio. We also would like to extend our heartfelt gratitude to every donor and season ticket holder for always answering the call through loyal support of Texas A&M Athletics and our student athletes. We will be back soon with more content. Thanks and gig em.